Greg, hello, how are you? Hi, Andy. Very good. Very warm. How are you? <laughs> I'm so very warm as well. It's terrible. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I don't know how the Tudors survived in both Tudor clothing and a lack of cooling technology. Yeah. Um, it's not called a rough for nothing, I think. <laughs> yes, thank goodness. Thank goodness we're not <laughs> leading a rough life. That would be bad. <laughs> um, okay, so we've already introduced both of ourselves via bad jokes, which in some ways is introduction enough. However, could you introduce yourself and just explain to our um, viewers, other than bad jokes, which you and I share, I think, as things we're committed to professionally, could you yep. tell us a bit more about, about the work that you do, please? Okay. Um, this is this could be difficult. Um, I am Greg <laughs> Walker, and I teach English literature at the University of Edinburgh, uh, and I kind of live in that gap between medieval and early modern uh, in the reign of Henry VIII, but kind of going forward and back. And I also, in a rather awkward socially awkward way, st uh, straddle, if I can use that word, um, history and literature. So I am also interested in facts and people, which I guess is why I signed up for all this in the end, because I, I just want to know what people were like and what they felt back then. Not quite talking with the dead, maybe, but at least listening to them. Yeah, yeah. Um, any particular dead in particular? Have you got like a top five favourite dead? People. Well, the um, <laughs> good thing about history is that they are all dead now, which I think is comforting. Uh, so I don't know. Well, uh, yeah, there was a crucial moment in my youth when I was going to be a Stuart person and work on the 17th mm -hmm. century with Kevin Sharp, the, the mm -hmm. late great Kevin Sharp. And then he bastard got a fellowship to the States and went off. And so I was reduced to the reign of Henry VIII. Uh, which I then discovered. Put the Stuart period with him. <laughs> he did. He couldn't do it. He, he had a. He's got a patent. You know, <laughs> cease and desist studying Charles the First when when Kevin's not in Britain. Okay, so that took you to. So, the yeah, so I ended up doing Henry the Eighth, as it were, and uh, <laughs> finding out that there were all these poets which we didn't really do in literature, like Skelton and uh, John Hayward. Uh, we may talk about in a minute. And folk like that, Thomas Eliot, uh, who were really interesting, but to, you but don't find them on English services. So I was kind of working on a period that was trendy in history departments, but I was doing it in the wrong way because I liked the poetry. Mm. So to thank God I got a job, really, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. That's really fascinating. And, and you're already in dialogue with quite a few films. Um, we've already made of people like Catherine Richardson thinking about that, that um, what it feels like to sit in that weird space between history and literature. And actually, I don't think we have made any films of anyone who's identified themselves as sitting in the gap between medieval and early modern. So that's very exciting. Oh, yeah. um, and I'm excited to hear about forgotten poetry. I'm struck that the one word you haven't used yet, which I was expecting to hear, was the word theatre. Well, yeah, I mean, theatre came a little bit later when I worked out that they also had plays. Um, <laughs> Because I hadn't really looked at the, the theatre until I'd done the PhD. And then it was this kind of exploding moment when I saw all this stuff from the pre-Shakespeare period, you know, stuff yeah. that you've been working on really impressively for the last three or four years and discovering not only the plays, but also the theatres mm. where it was done. And that sort of, yeah, then, then I was sold. I knew that this was what I wanted to do for the rest of my life, working on plays you could never really <laughs> ever hope to see. <laughs> and then try to put them on. And now suddenly you can. Yeah. yeah, thank you. You're being very modest here, but yeah, you're absolutely someone who is allowing us to see plays that you otherwise would never see um, uh, in lots of... Well, I'm also thinking of, of Robert Crichton and his kind of Beyond Shakespeare project that's really fantastically doing, at the moment, mostly audio yeah. versions of the drama. But, uh, you know, I wish that had been around when, when I was doing a PhD or, or even you know, straight out of grad school it would have been fantastic yeah absolutely so um for those watching this film on our web page there'll be a resources list um so if you look below our film you'll find that and um we'll be talking about your book uh greg exactly there exactly there um we're talking about your book in a moment. i always wanted to do that <laughs> so asking people to vote yes. uh, vote, vote for john hayward uh we'll talk about your book greg and john soon. yes um <laughs> But, but we'll make sure to put a link to Beyond Shakespeare because that's mm. absolutely a resource we should push people towards. Um, so, okay, you mentioned theatre as something that you discovered later, and I think that's just historiographically, that's where scholarship has gone as well, right? It's taken mm. a while to kind of go, oh, theatre. Yes. Um, but you also mentioned theatres as in 
the physical spaces. And, and we're speaking just a week after the announcement of the discovery of the Red Lion, which mm. is being pitched at the moment as um, London's first playhouse. And I wonder if this might be a useful way for us to cunningly segue to your book to yes. think about... See where you're going. Yeah. Um, basically, do you have any chips on your shoulder? And I, I will join <laughs> you in this chip fest um, when it comes to thinking about when our first London hmm. playhouse happens. Are you thinking of the, the primary fruit, which is uh, <laughs> um, John Rastell's stage in Finsbury yeah. Park or Finsbury Fields? Which, I, I mean, I technically, is it a theatre? I mean, my, for my money, it is. It's a professionally constructed, semi-permanent stage in the grounds of his house where plays were put on, plays supported by a kind of backstage team that made costumes and presumably ran the theatre on a semi-commercial basis. And I think that's probably the first theatre that we know about. Yeah. But it's not, it's in, it's a, it's a stage in a house. <laughs> you know. Yeah. I mean, to me, yeah, again, I, you know, I feel very relaxed about the definition of um, playhouse, which is my, my preferred term mm, of someone who's previously historical about it in that um, I like to think about, multiple kinds of houses and multiple kinds of play so for me that absolutely sounds like a, a playhouse and just to ground this in historical dates that will help perhaps or, uh, listeners who are new to this um we tend to think of the, play, of the playhouse the movement to build playhouses as, as a shakespearean one um dated towards the late 1570s with spaces like the theater growing up as shakespeare himself grows up um the Red Lion is, what is it, 10 years earlier than that. Uh, but the space that you're now pointing us towards is a good 40 years earlier than that in the yeah. um, early 30s. 25, right? 26. So, I mean, it's, it is really early. So, but, I mean, it, like you, I'm relaxed because, you know, I, I've got a roadshow that's really a 10 minute material on, you know, what was theatre like before there were theatres and the notion yeah. that, you know, this early theatre lives and dies in spaces it didn't own. So, it has to adapt itself make itself at home in great halls in in yards in all kinds of different places so it's and that is integral to the nature of the theater that existed you know it, it lives in a space like the great hall in a, in a tudor house for instance yeah yeah once and, you and, concretize the architecture you're saying something about what plays have to be like yes absolutely and that line between a great house and a, and, and a playhouse it's mm. not an especially clear one, uh, clear one in itself. I guess um, in a minute I'll ask you to introduce your book properly, but the big thing I've taken from, from your book is just how much theatrical activity is happening in the late 1520s and early 1530s, mm. but, also, but, but coinciding with the publication of those plays and at the same time coinciding with um, unusually frenetic political debate about what England is and what God is what the king can do, uh, mm. who the queen is. Um, and it feels like theatre, both on the page and on the stage, is responding in an incredibly live way to that, including your book is very very uh, excitingly thinking about revisions um, mm. to, to bring these texts already very contemporary, to bring them even more up to date. Yeah, could you tell us a bit, a bit more about that? Oh, yeah, well, where to start? Um, I guess one place to start is to say, you know, what is it that makes theatre happen? Once you've got uh, a theatre, mm. it's it's self fulfilling. You know, it needs plays, it needs material to consume and produce to bring in audiences. Mm. But we're thinking now in the fifteen twenties, fifteen tens about theatre that's prompted by some other question, and I think it it comes out of that humanist idea that that the arts are there to counsel and to reflect on politics. So when you get extraordinary events that traumatize people and they don't know quite what to do about them because they're kind of revolutionary or life-threatening or just plain weird, then one of the places they look is literature and one of the most immediate places in literature that they look is theatre. So to write a play as a way of trying to understand what the hell Henry VIII is doing today is actually quite a natural thing for that humanist culture to be dealing with, you know, to thinking about the work of uh, Erasmus and Thomas More, you know, that, that was what they thought about. You know, think about the court and you think about playing and acting because that's by and large what you did in front of kings anyway. You, you had to pretend to be a kind of, a kind of person that he's not going to kill and he's going to give lots of reward to. 
so the, the fine line between you know living at court and being a player was there already. And you know the book is about John Hayward, the most neglected, brilliant playwright <laughs> ever discussed. Um, and you know one of the things that he well, he discovered was really he was good at and enabled him to talk about politics were these kind of dialogue interlude plays that he put on. You know, what is the church is one of the questions which he keeps coming back to. What is true belief? What can kings do? What are their powers? Should you let them use them? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So um, would you mind telling us a bit more then about the, the book itself? Uh, and perhaps also if you would be willing to just um, what the challenges were in writing that book, because I can already see that um, in terms of the different... Carrying it was a challenge. It's a heavy book. Just carrying it round. Ah, it's a big book. It's a big book. I, I happen to have one here, Andy. Just <laughs> look at that. Very good. Yep. Oh, you referred to the cover earlier, and I couldn't remember if I it's love the cover or not. But that's yeah, I that's do love good. the cover. Warhol. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it feels like um, the kind of evidential basis of Hayward's writing career is must have been a real challenge, both to try and determine. Um, I mean, you're, you're sort of having to argue for it at the same time as you're trying to interpret it across yeah. the map. And that, that must be yeah. very difficult. Well, it, it's kind of like, I guess, like most medievalists do. Or, you know, those archaeology shows when they say we have this tiny fragment of porcelain, which we think was probably a 38-room palace. And then, that, <laughs> then you make show you what the palace looks like. So you, you're kind of having to extrapolate. But... And this was the first biography I've ever written. So I was really excited to see whether that was really very easy or a complete dumpster fire. And it was problematic. I, you know, I struggled with how do you tell a story about someone's life when really you've only got two grants of land and a small poem for a whole decade. You're right. Uh, and Haywood's material is great. I mean, there are two or three year periods when there are four or five texts. There's mentions of him in the archives, there are people writing about him and saying things. And then there are periods when there aren't. And it's quite a challenge, as you can rather politely say, to fill those gaps in. And one of the great things is he was someone who happened to marry well. He married into Rastel and Thomas More's family. So if Hayward wasn't doing something, you can be pretty sure that one of the Rastels or Thomas More or Margaret More was probably doing something interesting and Hayward might have been around about, probably just in the kitchen making a cup of tea or something. <laughs> and you could speculate on what he might have thought about yeah. Yeah, those yeah, kind yeah. of things. Um, and, and it turns out, I think, although it kind of might be a circular argument, that a lot of what he did write tended to be ruminating about mm. what Uncle Thomas More was doing. And you know, particularly when he faced various moments of personal crisis, Hayward tended to seemingly to kind of model his response on what did Moore do? Should I do the same? Can I do something different? So there's there's lots. Of, it's a good. It's an interesting story. These I mean, you can't really go wrong telling the story of 1528 to 1550-ish because there's always something happening. Someone's dying, and if they're not dying this year, they probably die next year. Yes, I love that. Um, I feel like uh, for reasons of historical pedantry. I should say that John Hayward, if he is in the kitchen, is very unlikely to be making a cup of tea. Uh, he <sighs> may have been an innovative writer, but I don't think we can credit him with that, that level of... Um, He's uh, exploring beverage. it. Come on. <laughs> beverage innovation. Um, I mean, one of the moments in the book where, what well, can you imagine? I never understand how early modern playwrights, uh, late medieval playwrights, wrote such a lot of things without without having coffee. You know, incredibly... Uh, no chips, well done for them. no coffee. Yes. God. That's um, my entire first 30 years of my life gone. <laughs> the, the, one of the moments in the book where I felt, um, uh, I was going to say very sorry for you, but that sounds really patronising, I apologise. But the moment in which I was like, oh, oh no, what, what a nightmare, was <laughs> when you finally pinned him down to St Paul's. But there's a phantom extra, super oh. confusing John Hayward, <laughs> also at St Paul's, who may or may not be the playwright. You got two Can you imagine? <laughs> If there are two John Haywards at exactly the same time who knew the same people. And so John Hayward tends to do things and you have to say, well, mm, is that likely to be this one? And the really, really annoying thing is one of them was a, a, a petty canon, a, a priest, so shouldn't have got married. And you could say, right, the one with the wife must be the playwright. 
And then for a four-year period, they were allowed to marry. And he did. <laughs> so everything, all those distinctions went. <laughs> well, I think I kind of provisionally sort of <laughs> worked out a rough rule of thumb that there's the tall one and there's the not so tall one. And <laughs> say that, shakes, that Shakespeare's approach to women, I think. Uh, <laughs> Yes, but you do a fine, you do a fine job with it, and as you say, John Hayward, our playwright, is someone who really likes the duality. You know, he'd love this Zoom meeting, wouldn't he? He likes the duality mm -hmm. of two people on stage discussing something back and forth. Yes. And he'd want four. He'd want four people. <laughs> right, one yeah. who looked a bit like you, but talked like me, and the reverse. <laughs> and then you have this evidential, you know, documentary basis, which is giving you exactly the same um, <laughs> problem. That's very strange. Mm. So, if if we were in some sort of John Hayward emergency, Greg, where you had to say, you know, three key things to summarise Hayward's career, um, what, what core facts would you want our listeners to know? And I know this is a difficult question, not least because it's such a, a surprisingly long career, I think. Mm. Um, that was the, Number one would be survival, I think. I mean, I'm calling the book Comedy and Survival, so I suppose that's my two, two of my three. I mean, he managed to still be at court and still writing slightly edgy if kind of whimsical political comedy under Elizabeth having done so under Mary Edward and Henry and all his various mm. insane tyrannical guises so part of it is how you manage to do that mm. you know, how do you manage to do that without being a kind of toady yes person who has no values at all uh, obviously no contemporary and illusions there mm. um, but then the second one is comedy. Mm. Yeah, how do you how do you be funny? What why be funny? How how can you make comedy out of the Reformation without being that kind of aggressive hectoring uh, Ben Elton style John Bale? You know, my name's John Bale. This is Protestantism. Good night. That kind of thing. <laughs> and Hayward does. You know, he said he, he he's always about consensus and you know, well, yes, transubstantiation, but you know, Jesus, we all love him. And consensus is a time when consensus is very unfashionable. Exactly, and and keeps at it. Mm. And then finally, at the very end, say, oh, screw this, I'm off to the Netherlands. I mean, it, it takes him a very long time to give up. I mean, he, almost his whole family had, had gone into exile at least twice and come back before he decided, okay, I have to go, which is... Yeah. Uh, and he spent the last 15 years of his life in the Netherlands running away from murder, basically, from <laughs> Protestant troops who were trying to kill Catholics. Mm. Not the retirement he was planning, I fear. But uh, No one wants that retirement, do they? That's no. Um, <laughs> and on average, no. And when you say comedy, there's quite a distinctive sort of shape to his literary career, right? And that sometimes that means plays and other times it means proverbs. Could you tell us a bit more about yeah. that? Well, that, I mean, again, yeah, that's a good question. I like, I like your style. Um, yeah. the, the thread is comedy, but he applies it to a range of different genres, quite marked and distinct. Yeah, first of all, he's a playwright, and then he becomes a kind of partial playwright, but mostly a singer and, and writer of songs. And yet they're songs about merriment and festivity and hospitality, but they're also cogedly about not killing Thomas More and what proper Catholics can do under Protestant uh, legislation. Yeah. Then there's this period when he starts to collect proverbs and epigrams. Um, and he kind of remodels himself as a voice of London citizenry, writing for the kind of middle classes in London and collecting their sayings and replaying them to them as kind of jokes. And being Hayward, he doesn't just collect them. He makes them funny in as much as <laughs> some of them still are moderately funny, but, the, you know, there's a lot of them and some of them are a bit kind of clunky. But, and, and this, you know, he liked to make people laugh. His key word is merry. He wanted to make merry with his readers. Um, and he draws you into this mm. imagined merry world of good company. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And you're really good as well on um, the politics of, of merriness, because as you say, a modern audience will see that word and think, well, that's the very opposite of political engagement. Um, and I'm speaking to someone, as someone who's recently read Harriet Phillips' book as well on, on Tudor nostalgia, uh, oh, which is also awesome. very good on, mm. yeah, just, just recently out, very good as well on, on merriment. Um, as I'll a kind put of, that in the resources <laughs> so that, I can look put it down there because I'm going to chase that up. It is, it is here somewhere. I could flash up on screen, but um, 
merriment? Yeah, merriment as a word which immediately makes a, um, a mid, well, a 16th century audience think about Reformation politics mm. and about which kinds of Christianity have made England merry, effectively. Yes, yes. I mean, so partly it's that kind of nostalgia for merry England, which was always about 30 years before, whenever anyone spoke. You, you can go back to Lydgate, Langland, Chaucer, Gower, and they're all saying, oh, it was merry 30 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, there's also a particular merriness, I think, that, that Hayward evokes, which is the merriness of um, religious communion. You know, he talk, t- Thomas More did this really kind of biting satirical quip uh, at his trial, when he says, you know, well, you're going to condemn me now, but just as St. Paul condemned St. Stephen to death. But now they're both merry in heaven together. I'm sure one day we will meet and we will be merry in heaven. So there's a very pointed use of that word merry, and it means, you bastards, that you know, like St. Paul, there's a good hope you might have some kind of cataclysmic conversion to truth, and yeah. then we'll be fine again. It's, I mean, I'm going to adopt that when I need to be passive aggressive for the future. If I'm, if I'm having an absolutely oh, yeah. massive row with someone, I'll be going, we're going to be happy together in the future. That's, <laughs> it's a good line. No, 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 that's not the face. You have to be... Oh. <laughs> it's, very, it's very disarming, I think. It's a good yes, thing. you have to be, oh, we should be merry. Let us be merry. <laughs> um, so is it okay, Greg, if we route this for our listeners in a particular example of Hayward's writing? And mm-hmm. please feel free to go wherever you would like to go. But the one example that I'd suggest, and you are welcome to turn us down, but partly given the heat we mentioned at the start of the film and partly because I was lucky enough to see your staging of of it, I wonder if the play of the weather is, is a useful way to think about uh, what Hayward is doing with and to Henry's court. Mm. Um, so would you mind telling, it, again, if it... Yeah. If we can even see a bit, example, perhaps. Say that again? We could even see a bit, if the technology yes. permits. But, yeah. uh, let's, let's put a little clip in here. For since that heaven and earth were first created, stood we never in such triumphant estate as now we do. Whereof we will report such part as we see meet for time present, chiefly concerning your perpetual comfort, as the thing self shall prove in experiment, which highly shall bind you on knees lowly bent, solely to honour our highness day by day. And now, to the matter. Give ear, and we will say. And then, could you just talk us through, um, yeah, the play of the weather, could you give us a very brief um, kind of summary of it, and then tell us what you think it, this play is doing? Mm, okay, yeah. I mean, the play of the weather is in some ways a really odd play, in which nothing very much happens, in that um, King Jupiter comes down to Earth and says he's worried that people are worried about the weather, and he'd like to know what a good weather would look like. And then the, the play is essentially uh, a handful of people coming on stage, visiting the king and making the pitch for the weather that they really want uh, and, and making it sound as if it's the weather that everyone needs. So the windmiller wants a lot of wind, uh, the watermiller wants a lot of rain, the gentleman wants nice weather for hunting, uh, the laundress wants hot sun and, and baking heat for drying sheets and that kind of thing. And then the, the vice figure, the comedian of the play, who's called Merry Report, which is a very Haywardian thing. Whatever it is, he'll tell you it in a merry way. Comes on and says, well, I don't know what you're going to do with all this. You've got 10 completely different uh, demands for weather. And then he lists them all. I don't know, he says, you know, who'd be a king? And then Jupiter says, well, I've got, just watch. And then he, at the end, he says, well, you can all have the weather you want, but only for some of the time. And then everyone says, fantastic, we've got the weather we want. Um, then Mary Report says, you've got the weather just as it was before. Yeah. And that's the kind of symbol crashing punchline of the play in a way. But what Hayward does with that is he makes it, I think, into an allegory, if it wasn't already at the moment of conception, an allegory, an allegory of, of the politics of the late 1520s, particularly the summoning of the Reformation Parliament, which, as, you, as we all know, uh, was called to try and sort out divisions of opinion over religion and reform this rather loose phrase, diverse enormities, which was a kind of phrase thrown out at various points. And so Hayward has a play in which Jupiter comes to Earth and says, I've just come from a parliament that's dissolved into rancor, but I've sorted it out and we're now going to resolve diverse uh, enormities, he says. So that word, I think, 
the audience would have been pricking up their ears and thinking, oh, hello, that, that sounds contemporary. So when Jupiter and Mary Report are sitting there watching people coming in and making self-interested pleas for particular kinds of weather, you know, you can see mapped onto that loosely. People saying all kinds of things about what a perfect commonwealth would look like and what religious reform would look like. So when at the end Jupiter says, well, let's leave things more or less as they were, but keep everyone happy. I think that's Hayward's version of, you know, is this possible? Yeah. Who'd, want to, who'd want to consult a state as divided as ours about something as important as the state of the church? Yeah, thank you. Um, if it's right to kind of summarise and respond to what you said and then to see what, what, what you make mm -hmm. of that. Um, I often do quite a lot of uh, very amateur etymology Googling when I have these a bit lit conversations. Ooh. It just occurred to me, I don't actually know the etymology of, of enormous or enormity at mm. all. And it looks like it, you know, it just has nothing to do with size, mm. but to do with deviations from standard patterns and, and expected um, mm. behaviours. Um, so transgression, in other words. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, they are bad things. They're not big things. Uh, they, are, they are big only in the awfulness of their nature. Yes. And, and they're also vague things. We, I mean, it, it's like one of those, like apple pie. You know, everyone's in favour of apple pie, even if you don't like apples. Everyone is against the normatives. They would be bad. Okay, yes. Yeah, that, that's really helpful. Uh, and your book is very good at just how topical that word is and how it's hmm. at a time when suddenly a lot of things which have been thought of as normal are suddenly <laughs> being characterised as deviations hmm. and things which are deviations suddenly being characterised as things which have always been there. For example... Of course, England has always been an independent yes. empire, yes. Um, which we, we're now announcing for the first time, but also clarifying this has always been the case. It's just we've forgotten to yes. say it previously. There's lots if we had to choose a moment when it was the most independent, it would be now. Yes. So there's that going on. Um, Got and a cake, going to eat it, but going to keep it on, in view at all times. Yes. Absolutely. Um, and then running through your account of Hayward's plays in general, I think, is that he's a playwright who likes to return at the end to a situation at the beginning, but that isn't the end of the story for you, that, that almost by dint of returning to the beginning, the play ends up revising that beginning. Mm -hmm. And I, I was particularly struck by that. Um, as you know, my first book was on a later playwright who's also been marginalised, John Lilly, and mm -hmm. one of Lilly's plays ends by describing its conclusion as being an, an end where we first began, it's a quotation yeah. from Sappho and Theo, an end where we first began which it absolutely isn't in Sappho and Thea. That's a radical rewriting of what, what <laughs> the is giving us. And it feels like Hayward is doing something similar in returning its audience to where it started, but asking them to feel very differently about it. And in this case, it feels like they're being asked to feel differently about it because the king is telling them to. Yep. Which is an example <laughs> of an enormity. <laughs> yes, yes. It's, uh, I mean, the great thing about Hayward is it's, it's the, you know, the traditional coin, you know, on the one hand, but then turn it over, it's the opposite, turn it back again. Oh, it's still the opposite, but it's different. Yeah. And Hayward, I mean, you've got that kind of satisfactory, slightly conservative, nostalgic feeling of everything was okay after all. It was, you know, those, there are lots of them, aren't there? He said vaguely. Um, what is it? Oh, the, the count, the... the what are those mice, you know? The, <laughs> the country mouse and the town mouse. Okay, yes. You know, they both hate their lives and then, you know them. <laughs> and I was then, going through chocolate mice. I was going through the, um, the moon in. Is it the moon in on the moon? Oh dear. Anyway, I was going through other kinds oh, of. Oh, the clangers. Clangers. That's where I was yeah. going. That's where oh, we love the clangers. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But, uh, you know, so there's, that, <laughs> there's that sort of comforting feeling that actually it wasn't as bad as you thought it was. You yeah. saw the other side and. Um, that was worse. But having done that, Hayward actually suggests that the going through the process of exploring the other side of the coin, the other people's views, you do get a better sense of, of the world uh, and its problems. And you come back not kind of naively um, resolved to leave things as they are, but probably quite cynically convinced that the world is full of shysters and charlatans who are going to get one over on you if they can. So actually start with the status quo and make it better rather than throw everything up in the air and start from scratch. So it's that kind of enormity of the Reformation. You, you've got Erasmus's view, which is, yes, everything in the Catholic Church is a bit rubbish. How do you make it better? Well, you just make it better. Versus Bale's, everything in the Catholic Church is complete rubbish and you just need to break it into a thousand pieces and build something new. 
And Hayward's very much of the let's make it better and let's mock them into reforming themselves. And he kind of hits a, a brick wall with Henry VIII, yes. who is yes. a bit like certain American presidents that we can imagine, that you just keep telling them that there's like something extraordinarily foolish. And they say, oh, no, I didn't. <laughs> I don't think you found I, No, I, it's, it's always been an empire. The Pope? No, he's got no power. <laughs> well, I wrote a treatise? Who are you kidding? That was Thomas More wrote a treatise saying the Pope had got all the power. You know, so the constant rewriting of history that, that the Henrician Reformation requires, Henry is kind of, uh, Hayward is kind of following Henry along, picking up bits of paper and saying, didn't you say this last year? Or, you know, isn't this idea still relevant? Or, you know, what about you, what you said about indulgences? Yes, which is, I mean, it's incredibly politically disturbing because it's, it's a reinforcement of a kind of tyranny as a kind of democracy in that, you know, the play the weather, you end up being told um, if any of these mortal characters got their way, all of the rest of them would be unhappy all of the time. Mm. And so thank yep. goodness Henry's in charge. Someone like Henry is in charge mm. um, and who can provide us with, with his will. So his will yep. then gets presented as a kind of democratic ideal. And then there's this kind of this reinforcing of the idea that here is the status quo and it's fine, even as the status could not be less quo. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Latinatisms, yes. <laughs> I mean, I think the, the, you know, what he says, I think, is yes, absolutely, Henry, be an autocrat. But the only good thing to do if you're an autocrat is not to touch anything. Oh. You know, it's that moment when you, you sidle up to power and say, yes, of course you're godlike, but, you know, if you were God, you would just tiptoe quietly away and let people get on with things. At a time when everyone else is saying, you know, you must use your powers mm. to change things. Mm. And, you know, it's a losing hand to play, but Hayward keeps playing it like a re long retreat from Moscow through the 30s, through the 40s. <laughs> and then remarkably through Edward's reign, you know, when he becomes something of a celebrity and then keeps going. And then Mary comes along and he has to do it again. You know, there's, there are a couple of years of celebration that, thank God, Catholicism is back. And, you know, we, we really want to support your majesty and restoring Catholicism. Oh my God, but not by burning people. Please don't burn people. I mean, so he has this difficult dance of loyalty with, with Queen Mary saying, you know, a merciful queen is what we need. Yeah. Um, if it's okay, I'd like to return to the idea of Edwardian celebrity in a minute, because that fascinates me. Mm -hmm. But before we move away from the theatre, um, we've talked about how Hayward likes dialogue, and we've mm -hmm. talked about the kind of political import of watching these plays. Um, on stage. Um, I think of Hayward partly thanks to you as someone who's also deeply performative. Mm -hmm. And I also I think of you as a scholar, as someone who has really driven the way we think about performativity on stage, um, mm -hmm. non-linguistic kinds of storytelling uh, on stage. Um, I think you're the first scholar I ever saw use the phrase kinetic energy, for example. And, mm -hmm. Help me think about the play of the weather's fascination with, you know, Jupiter as this image of authority on at one end of the stage, and the play constantly exploring who gets to come close to him and who is in be between him. You mentioned um, Mary. Forgive me. What's the name of the character? Oh, Mary Report. Mary Report as kind of an intermediary figure allowing access. Yes, so would it be all right either to correct that terrible account of play of the weather's dramaturgy, or could you just tell us a bit more about Hayward's? Across, across his plays, Hayward's mm. other kinds of stage effects? Well, I mean, at it, it, the risk of turning this into a flatter fest, I mean, one of the things that I, I where that idea came across was, was looking exactly at your stuff on mm. Lily, because it seemed to me that you know, Lily was very careful about staging balance in place, you know, on, in, on stage. And there are often kind of props or locations in Lily's plays around which characters move. And they kind of symbolize order or lack of order by how they relate to it. Hmm. And obviously, um, the Tudor court, Tudor society more generally, is very aware of, of movement and the kind of intellectual, emotional, political, yeah. uh, embodied implications of being in a space. Yeah. So who is near, I mean, the David Starkey thing of you know, who is close to Henry VIII was kind of metaphorical for historians, but you know, it's literal for David Starkey, you know, who, who, is as, who can get to touch the king's bottom is, is the, the ultimate goal of all kind of courtship. 
Should we and, and what, that for our listeners as to what you mean by that? <laughs> oh, um, okay, yes. <laughs> I don't think we can leave that hanging as it no, were. No, as it were, no. Um, <laughs> cue lots of punning. No, I will resist. Um, oh, his view is that the, the, the most important job at the Tudor court is not chancellor, but the groom of the stool, whose job is to attend to Henry when he's actually on the loo, mm. on his close stool, hence the name. Because that's when you have the king at his most private and vulnerable. And so I guess the Starkey model is that rather than saying, you know, would you like some water and, uh, oh dear, my lord, uh, dodgy curry last night. Um, what he's actually saying is, I believe there's some estates coming up in Hertfordshire that my cousin <laughs> Reginald might be a good man for. And Cardinal Wolsey looking a bit old and tired, don't you think? Time for a change. So you've got this notion that, you know, physical proximity means political power. And I think the theatre playwrights, actors, um, understand that yeah. in terms of their own craft and so can make very clever points in plays, creating effects by having movement. I mean, one of the first ones that I saw was obviously Skelton's Magnificence, which I think was probably quite important for Hayward's development. And there's a character called Measure, who is that kind of Aristotelian principle between the excesses. And what he tends to do is be a merry mean, he says, meaning you know, a happy compromise between excesses. But actually, he is a mean on stage. He walks to and fro like Mary Report does. Mm. So you've got this kind of dramaturgy of significant movement. Mm. And if your play is happening in the Great Hall of a Tudor palace, where who gets to sit where, who gets to move where, who serves on, uh, on whose table, is a sign of status then you can map that onto the play as well so yeah. you know, movement in one direction suggests virtue order social climbing all those kind of things moving in the other direction disgrace shame bawdiness <laughs> you know it, it's it's a theater we've kind of lost to some extent although i've always struck by you know the the way theaters comedians in particular can still get laughs in a modern theater by joking about the people who've paid a lot for their seats mm. and the people that haven't. Um, but if John Lennon, you know, clap your hands and use you at the front, rattle your jewelry. You know, there's that notion that audiences become different kinds of people if actors tell them they are. Yeah, that's fascinating. Right, a long way around. Oh, it's great. It's great. And um, you're absolutely right that the audience are embodying this at court. Um, in terms of where they're sat or where they're stood in relation to the monarch. But I presume that's also true, even if the monarch isn't present and even if the performance is not at court. I mean, even even to the extent that the fact that you're not at court is already a statement about proximity and distance. Um, yeah. But those hierarchies are so firmly embodied and embedded in your clothing and your position um, amongst people of certain genders, people of certain hierarchies, even if you're not at court. That I presume mm. constantly these plays are speaking to that issue of who's close, who is physically close to who. Yeah. Um, and how you how you just live in your space is significant yeah. in those terms. And yeah. you know, actors can suddenly perform power or powerlessness simply by responding to the space around them yeah. and the audience in different ways. Yeah, yeah, and one of the great yeah. things that when Tom Betteridge and I uh, worked on the play of the weather at Hampton Court. Um, we hadn't really got a, a clue about how we were going to sit people. And then just as people were coming in, Tom said, right, women on the left, men on the right. Hmm. Oh, hello, that's bold. Um, and that was the most remember memorable thing for a lot of people of that performance. You know, they were watching jokes about women's bodies, being very aware that there were a group of men looking at them or a group of women looking at them. And so talking to people afterwards, you know, they were saying, well, could I laugh at that? Should I laugh at that? Did I laugh at that? And that was kind of you know, brilliant in a small example of, of the sort of thing that excites me, looking, thinking of an audience and how you would respond, knowing that you yourself are being looked at yes. while you're watching a play. And if you're being looked at by your king, laughing at a comedy about kingship, mm. that's pretty fraught, I would have thought. <laughs> yeah, and again, there's something that we've lost in contemporary theatre, and in many ways, thank goodness we've lost it, but um, because theatre tends to be an art form 
open to strange community groups of strangers mm -hmm. um that the art form we're describing is is performed to people who know each other and whose relationships are a source of anxiety yes. stress yeah. performativity as you as you reminded us um reminded us earlier i'm, I'm looking at the time greg so i'm going to move oh, to um two final two final questions um and I promise I will ask about Edwardian celebrity because I'm excited about that. <laughs> no, no, we can. Given that you mentioned um, your work with Thomas Betteridge um, and also Ellie Rycroft, I feel we should give it a shout mm, out to who's absolutely. been very important to my way of thinking. Um, it's, yeah, it's a bit of a, a massively open question, although that doesn't really distinguish it from anything I've said to you so far. But <laughs> what, what does it mean to stage these plays? And what do you get from that as a scholar? Feel free to make that a more specific question if you like. <laughs> No, it's a good one. Um, well, I mean, you touched on it for a start. I mean, it get because I was always a kind of it's what they used to call the lone scholar, which made it sound heroically like a cowboy in the Wild West. But it was actually a really dull thing to do. You know, you're at, uh, on your own in the archive, and then suddenly you put on a production, and you get to work with people whose skill sets are completely, astonishingly different and brilliant. So Ellie Rycroft, you know, was just incredible to work with her and Tom who's worked in the theatre I mean they both have got much more theatrical experience with me uh, than me and then working with actors and directors and you get in a room and you suddenly decide that everything you knew about play was wrong and you start again and they are the, the, the classic moment was you know I'd, I'd edited play of the weather and so from time to time an actor would turn up and say what does that line mean and I would say well, it's a bit of a clever pun. It either means X or the opposite of X. And they say, oh, for God's sake, I've got to just say it, and it's got to mean something. Which one is it? And you know, that, that, that suddenly makes you aware that you know, the performative is about choices as well as everything else. You know, the actor makes the choice and lives with the consequences of that choice. And you know, Hayward had to perform it one way or another. You had to, you know, the ambiguity had to be performed ambiguity rather than relying on a kind of Latinate pun that you need a footnote to understand. Do you mind if I push back on that a little bit? I'm fascinated mm. by it. Um, and I, and I'm, I'm fully behind the idea of choices and I'm really mm. excited. But I, I also wonder if what the actor was telling you there proceeded from their own contemporary training and that contemporary performers are trained to, you know, to play a, play a particular reading of a line um, mm -hmm. And I don't know the answer to this, so this isn't really a challenge, but I, I wonder if <laughs> well, no, a challenge modern performer might be thinking actually that, that ambiguity is absolutely the heart of what they're trying to sell <laughs> when they deliver a line. I don't know if that's right or wrong, well, but I, I wonder. No, I, mean, I think that's right because they are ambiguous, but I think they're, they're ambiguous in, in ways that I was not wholly. Un I mean, the, the ambiguity in the text. Yes, yeah. And ambiguity and performance are different things, and that's what this taught me. And sometimes it was about, you know, what does that word mean? And I would say, well, it's either a wretch or it's a particular kind of horse. And they would say, well, you know, <laughs> you don't know, do you? <laughs> I would have to, I don't know, no. <laughs> and then they would, have, you know, they would then deliver the line in such a way that it might be a particular kind of horse or a wretch. But you know, then I had to go and write, don't know what this line means. Second edition, please check. So it was about testing the, the assumptions behind the, the, the edition as much as anything else. But yeah, I mean, the idea that, that modern acting, particularly what the actors used to say was the idea of Shakespearean training was the real block. Yeah, yeah. yeah you know, yeah, because yeah. everything pre um, the method, probably, Yes. Had to be performed in a Shakespearean way with a certain kind of rhythmic uh, delivery and a certain kind of set of assumptions. And they came to Haywood and thought, this is a complete mess. And particularly when they came to the another play that Tom and Ellie and I put on, the satire of the Three Estates, the Scottish play, you know, they, they thought, you know, this is not working, playing this like Shakespeare. You know, this, this requires a completely different approach to language and performance and what a play means. You know, it was six hours long for one thing. So, so you couldn't do that kind of third act stuff. Yeah. Sorry, I'm burbling. Stop me burbling. Oh, it's great. It's great. And it's one of the things I'm, I'm excited about contemporary academic and actor collaboration is I'm, I'm really hoping it's going to move. And I think you're someone who's helping us move there away from kind of traditional 20th century takes on Shakespearean acting, which probably mm -hmm. does just as much a disservice to Shakespeare as it does to someone like Haywood. 
Um, yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm particularly interested, I've been working for a while now with, uh, with fringe performers, live artists, comedians, um, dancers, people who have just not had these very unhelpful kind of post Stanislavski, post yes. um training, much of which is fantastic and exciting, but simply leads the text to be positioned in a really unhelpful place, I think, in yeah. the rehearsal room and in the actors' bodies. Um, I always think Stuart Lee is a great way into Haywood. <laughs> that me. way that you insult the audience, but you don't, and, but you are, but you're not. Right. You, know, you, can, you kind of bring them into a kind of rumination on yeah. the relationship between you and the audience, which is itself hilariously funny, but also authentic, but entirely bogus at the same time. And, you know, Haywood's the 16th century master of that kind of, I'm a complete vacuous entertainer or am I and that's how he got away with it for some of the time I think makes me wonder what people like John Lilly were doing if they read Hayward because again um, Lilly's writing so often described as being um, courtly in a kind of um, trying to think of a polite way of saying ass kissing kind of a way (laughs) you know um, but but it also has that very kind of John Cleese faulty towers uh, ability to sound polite whilst actually being incredibly mm. rude to the audience, and I, I, yeah. I think Hayward Hayward must have been read by um, later writers. It certainly feels like they're continuing that tradition. Mm. Um, and that's what they remember about him. If the all the anecdotes that survive outside the theatrical anecdotes are about Hayward pushing flattery to the point where it becomes insult. Um, with both with Edward and Mary and with the Duke of Northumberland, he would he would threaten to unsettle uh, social decorum by saying something um, controversial, insulting, and then realize, reveal that he hadn't. And this was you know, Ben Johnson made notes on two occasions about that, and Camden did. You know, that Hayward had this skill for for insulting the great, but they still loved him, which is what they said about. Lucian as well, who obviously was a you know, great founding writer for both Moore and Erasmus and Hayward and Russell. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you. And uh, in a way, I feel like maybe that's ticked the box of the question I was going to ask about his celebrity. Um, but mm. your telling is that, yeah, flattery bleeding into insult makes me a bit worried about all the flattery I've been trying to throw in your direction. I'd like <laughs> to hear there was no in, uh, attempt to push. Mortify them. Greg, we're ending these films by asking our contributors what feels like a, an innocuous and possibly slightly naive <laughs> question, but but what the word literature means to them, where it, where it sits in their vocabulary. And I guess, I mean, I'd be interested to hear your answer to this question, but I'd also wonder what Erasmus or Moore or Henry VIII or John Hayward mm-hmm. might say to this question. Um, feel free to answer in your voice or anyone <laughs> else. But yeah, what, what does that word mean to you? It's a, I, you kindly said you were going to ask this, so I had a thought. Now, it didn't come up with very much, but I mean, I, I think the only way it makes sense to me, obviously, literature means a load of different things to a load of different people in a load of different contexts. But to me, it's, it's more like a verb than a noun. It's, hmm. it's a thing we do to writing is what literature is for me. It's a way we approach it. Yeah, so we're, if we look at a piece of writing as literary, we think about it and we analyze it and we afford it certain kinds of privilege and attention that we wouldn't with other forms of writing. And, and because I started life as both a historian and a, a student of literature, then it didn't, I kind of got confused about why uh, a speech or a, an ambassador's letter or even an act of parliament were not literary because they obviously were. You know, they were full of tropes and conventions and the writer would push the trope and blur the genre. So I, I see, I guess, you know, literary as being the thing you do to complex, satisfying writing in order to kind of get answers out of it mm. that you would from... So it's a constantly movable feast. You know, the classic attack on 80s theory was that they would say a shopping list was as important as Moliere or whatever. And I guess they're right. You know, the shopping list was really interesting. Mm. Hmm, six carrots, but only four potatoes. Victor Hugo, what did he mean by this? You know, so it's what we do with the text that's, that makes it literary, I think. Yes. And there are obviously things that are not amenable to that. But there's a grey area where, you know, Thomas More talking to Parliament seems to me to be a literary text. Mm. Yeah, thank you. That's a terrific answer. <laughs> Discuss. Um, 
yeah, no, that's great. That's wonderful. Um, we recently made a film with the theatre maker Chris Good, who talked about theatre being anything where you put a frame around something and say, now pay attention to this. Yes, um, exactly. Yeah, that's cited, literature too. Uh, Chris cited a, a mid-20th century text. I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the author, but the text simply invites the reader to go away and make a salad. <laughs> <laughs> but then to think about it. So you would need your shopping list with your... Was it four potatoes and six carrots? I mean, to be mm, honest, it doesn't sound that delicious. I might not have radishes. that. Could <laughs> put some radishes in. Yeah. And cook the potatoes, preferably. Um, yeah. Uh, Greg, on that bizarre note, let's uh, finish the film. <laughs> and now we've invented a, a possibly poisonous salad. Uh, mm. What more could we ask for? Um, congratulations on the book. It's very exciting to see John Hayward being oh, um, championed uh, in this way. Um, and I've really enjoyed it. Come around again. Make, most, make the most of it now. Well, there might be a sequel, don't say that. Um, really enjoyed being made to think about John Rastell's um, playhouse in the 1520s, thinking about the play of the weather uh, on stage, uh, and tantalisingly hearing a little bit about Hayward's celebrity as someone famous for being insulting whilst flattering you or, or vice versa. Something for us all to aspire to, I feel. I encourage anyone who watches this film to go away and give that a try. Um, but obviously they need to read Hayward and Walker to, to do course. that. Yes. Um, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Andy. It's been a joy. <laughs> Take care. We can cool down now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>